This audio case is brought to you by Laudio. United States v. Comstock. Justice Breyer delivered the opinion of the court. A federal civil commitment statute authorizes the Department of Justice to detain a mentally ill, sexually dangerous federal prisoner beyond the date the prisoner would otherwise be released. We have previously examined a similar statute enacted under state law to determine whether they violate the Due Process Clause. But this case presents a different question. Here we ask whether the federal government has the authority under Article 1 of the Constitution to enact this federal civil commitment program or whether its doing so falls beyond the reach of a government of enumerated powers. We conclude that the Constitution grants Congress the authority to enact Section 4248 as necessary and proper for carrying into execution the powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States. The federal statute before us allows a district court to order the civil commitment of an individual who is currently in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons if that individual one has previously engaged or attempted to engage in sexually violent conduct or child molestation, two, currently suffers from a serious mental illness, abnormality, or disorder, and three, as a result of that mental illness, abnormality, or disorder, is sexually dangerous to others in that he would have serious difficulty in refraining from sexually violent conduct or child molestation if released. In order to detain such a person, the government, acting through the Department of Justice, must certify to a federal district judge that the prisoner meets the conditions just described, i.e., that he has engaged in sexually violent activity or child molestation in the past, and that he suffers from a mental illness that makes him correspondingly dangerous to others. When such a certification is filed, the statute automatically stays the individual's release from prison, thereby giving the government an opportunity to prove its claim at a hearing through psychiatric or other evidence. The statute provides that the prisoner shall be represented by counsel and shall have an opportunity at the hearing to testify, to present evidence, to subpoena witnesses on his behalf, and to confront and cross-examine the government's witnesses. If the government proves its claims by clear and convincing evidence, the court will order the prisoner's continued commitment in the custody of the Attorney General, who must make all reasonable efforts to cause the state where that person was tried or the state where he is domiciled to assume responsibility for his custody, care, and treatment. If either state is willing to assume that responsibility, the Attorney General shall release the individual to the appropriate official of that state. But if, notwithstanding such efforts, neither such state will assume such responsibility, then the Attorney General shall place the person for treatment in a suitable federal facility. Confinement in the federal facility will last until either, one, the person's mental condition improves to the point where he is no longer dangerous with or without appropriate ongoing treatment, in which case he will be released, or two, a state assumes responsibility for his custody, care, and treatment, in which case he will be transferred to the custody of that state. The statute establishes a system for ongoing psychiatric and judicial review of the individual's case, including judicial hearings at the request of the confined person at six-month intervals. In November and December 2006, the government instituted proceedings in the Federal District Court for the Eastern District of North Carolina against the five respondents in this case. Three of the five had previously pleaded guilty in federal court to possession of child pornography, and a fourth had pleaded guilty to sexual abuse of a minor. With respect to each of them, the government claimed that the respondent was about to be released from federal prison, that he had engaged in sexually violent conduct or child molestation in the past, and that he suffered from a mental illness that made him sexually dangerous to others.
During that same time period, the government instituted similar proceedings against the fifth respondent, who had been charged in federal court with aggravated sexual abuse of a minor, but was found mentally incompetent to stand trial. Each of the five respondents moved to dismiss the civil commitment proceeding on constitutional grounds. They claimed that the commitment proceeding is, in fact, criminal, not civil in nature, and consequently that it violates the Double Jeopardy Clause, the Ex Post Facto Clause, and the Sixth and Eighth Amendments. They claimed that the statute denies them substantive due process and equal protection of the laws. They claim that it violates their procedural due process rights by allowing a showing of sexual dangerousness to be made by clear and convincing evidence instead of by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And finally, they claimed that in enacting the statute, Congress exceeded the powers granted to it by Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, including those granted by the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. The District Court, accepting two of the respondents' claims, granted their motion to dismiss. It agreed with respondents that the Constitution requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and it agreed that, in enacting the statute, Congress exceeded its Article I legislative powers. On appeal, the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit upheld the dismissal on this latter legislative power ground. It did not decide the standard of proof question, nor did it address any of the respondents other constitutional challenges. The government sought certiorari and we granted its request, limited to the question of Congress's authority under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Since then, two other courts of appeals have considered that same question, each deciding it in the government's favor thereby creating a split of authority among the circuits. The question presented is whether the Necessary and Proper Clause, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, grants Congress authority sufficient to enact the statute before us. In resolving that question, we assume, but we do not decide, that other provisions of the Constitution such as the Due Process Clause, do not prohibit civil commitment in these circumstances. In other words, we assume for argument's sake that the federal constitution would permit a state to enact this statute, and we ask solely whether the federal government, exercising its enumerated powers, may enact such a statute as well. On that assumption, we conclude that the Constitution grants Congress legislative power sufficient to enact Section 4248. We base this conclusion on five considerations taken together. First, the Necessary and Proper Clause grants Congress broad authority to enact federal legislation. Nearly 200 years ago, this court stated that the federal government is acknowledged by all to be one of enumerated powers, which means that every law enacted by Congress must be based on one or more of those powers. But at the same time, a government entrusted with such powers must also be entrusted with ample means for their execution. Accordingly, the Necessary and Proper Clause makes clear that the Constitution's grants of specific federal legislative authority are accompanied by broad power to enact laws that are convenient or useful or conducive to the authority's beneficial exercise. Chief Justice Marshall emphasized that the word necessary does not mean absolutely necessary. In language that has come to define the scope of the necessary and proper clause, he wrote, Let the end be legitimate, let it be within the scope of the Constitution, and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end, which are not prohibited, but consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, are constitutional. We have since made clear that determining whether the necessary and proper clause grants Congress the legislative authority to enact a particular federal statute we look to see whether the statute constitutes a means 
that is rationally related to the implementation of a constitutionally enumerated power. Of course, as Chief Justice Marshall stated, a federal statute, in addition to be authorized by Article 1, Section 8, must also not be prohibited by the Constitution. But, as we have already stated, the present statute's validity under provisions of the Constitution other than the Necessary and Proper Clause is an issue that is not before us. Under the question presented, the relevant inquiry is simply whether the means chosen are reasonably adapted to the attainment of a legitimate end under the Commerce Clause or under other powers that the Constitution grants Congress the authority to implement. We have also recognized that the Constitution addresses the choice of means. Primarily, to the judgment of Congress, if it can be seen that the means adopted are really calculated to attain the end, the degree of their necessity, the extent to which they conduce to the end, the closeness of the relationship between the means adopted and the end to be attained, are matters for congressional determination alone. Thus, the Constitution, which nowhere speaks explicitly about the creation of federal crimes beyond those related to counterfeiting, treason, or piracies and felonies committed on the high seas or against the law of nations, Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 6, 10, and Article 3, Section 3, nonetheless grants Congress broad authority to create such crimes, and Congress routinely exercises its authority to enact criminal laws in furtherance of, for example, its enumerated powers to regulate interstate and foreign commerce, to enforce civil rights, to spend funds for the general welfare, to establish federal courts, to establish post offices, to regulate bankruptcy, to regulate naturalization, and so forth. Similarly, Congress, in order to help ensure the enforcement of federal criminal laws enacted in furtherance of its enumerated powers, can cause a prison to be erected at any place within the jurisdiction of the United States and direct that all persons sentenced to imprisonment under the laws of the United States shall be confined there. Moreover, Congress, having established a prison system, can enact laws that seek to ensure that system safe and responsible administration by, for example, requiring prisoners to receive medical care and educational training, and can also ensure the safety of the prisoners, prison workers, and visitors, and those in surrounding communities by, for example, creating further criminal laws governing entry, exit, and smuggling, and by employing prison guards to ensure discipline and security. Neither Congress's power to criminalize conduct, nor its power to imprison individuals who engage in that conduct, nor its power to enact laws governing prisons and prisoners is explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. But, Congress, nonetheless, possesses broad authority to do each of those things in the course of carrying into execution the enumerated powers vested by the Constitution in the government of the United States, authority granted by the Necessary and Proper Clause. Second, the Civil Commitment Statute before us constitutes a modest addition to a set of federal prison-related mental health statutes that have existed for many decades. We recognize that even a long-standing history of related federal action does not demonstrate a statute's constitutionality. A history of involvement, however, can nonetheless be helpful in reviewing the substance of a congressional statutory scheme, and in particular, the reasonableness of the relation between the new statute and pre-existing federal interests. Here, Congress has long been involved in the delivery of mental health care to federal prisoners and has long provided for their civil commitment. In 1855, it established St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the District of Columbia to provide treatment to the insane of the Army and Navy and of the District of Columbia. In 1857, it provided for confinement at St. Elizabeth's of any person within the District of Columbia who had been charged with a crime and who was insane or later became insane during the continuance of his or her sentence in the United States Penitentiary. In 1874, expanding the geographic scope of its statutes, 
Congress provided for civil commitment in federal facilities or in state facilities, if a state so agreed, of all persons who have been or shall be convicted of any offense in any court of the United States and who are or shall become insane during the term of their imprisonment. And in 1882, Congress provided for similar commitment of those charged with federal offenses who become insane while in the custody of the United States. Thus, over the span of three decades, Congress created a national federal civil commitment program under which any person who is either charged with or convicted of any federal offense in any federal court could be confined in a federal mental institution. These statutes did not raise the question presented here, for they all provided that commitment in a federal hospital would end upon the completion of the relevant terms of federal imprisonment as set forth in the underlying criminal sentence or statute. But in the mid-1940s, that proviso was eliminated. In 1945, the Judicial Conference of the United States proposed legislative reforms of the federal civil commitment system. The Judicial Conference based its proposals upon what this court has described as a long study by a conspicuously able committee. The committee studied, among other things, the serious problem faced by the Bureau of Prisons, namely what to do with insane criminals upon the expiration of their terms of confinement, where it would be dangerous to turn them loose upon society and where no state will assume responsibility for their custody. The committee provided examples of instances in which the Bureau of Prisons had struggled with the problem of paranoid and threatening individuals whom no state would accept, and it noted that in the Bureau's experience, the states would not accept an appreciable number of mentally incompetent individuals nearing expiration of their prison terms, because of their lack of legal residence in any state, even though those individuals ought not be at large because they constitute a menace to public safety. The committee, hence the Judicial Conference, therefore recommended that Congress enact some provision of law authorizing the continued confinement of such persons after their sentences expired. Between 1948 and 1949, Following its receipt of the Judicial Conference report, Congress modified the law. It provided for the civil commitment of individuals who are, or who become, mentally incompetent at any time after their arrest and before the expiration of their federal sentence, and it set forth various procedural safeguards with respect to an individual whose prison term is about to expire. It specified the following. Whenever the director of the Bureau of Prisons shall certify that a prisoner whose sentence is about to expire has been examined and, in the judgment of the director and the board of examiners, the prisoner is insane or mentally incompetent and, if released, he will probably endanger the safety of others, their property, or other interests of the United States and that suitable arrangements for the custody and care of the prisoner are not otherwise available, the Attorney General shall transmit the certificate to the court for the district in which the prisoner is confined, whereupon the court shall cause the prisoner to be examined and shall hold a hearing, if upon such hearing the court shall determine that the conditions specified above exist, the court may commit the prisoner to the custody of the Attorney General or his authorized representative. The precondition that the mentally ill individual's release would probably endanger the safety of the officers, the property, or other interests of the United States was uniformly interpreted by the judiciary to mean that his release would endanger the safety of persons, property, or the public interest in general not merely the interests peculiar to the United States as such. In 1984, Congress modified these basic statutes. As relevant here, it altered the provision just discussed regarding the prisoner's danger to the interests of the United States to conform more closely to the then existing judicial interpretation of that language i.e. 
It altered the language so as to authorize explicitly civil commitment if, in addition to the other conditions, the prisoner's release would create a substantial risk of bodily injury to another person or serious damage to the property of another. Congress also elaborated upon the required condition that suitable arrangements are not otherwise available by directing the Attorney General to seek alternative placement in state facilities as we have set forth above. With these modifications, the statutes continue to authorize the civil commitment of individuals who are both mentally ill and dangerous once they have been charged with or convicted of a federal crime. They continue to provide for the continued civil commitment of those individuals when they are due for release from federal custody because their sentence is about to expire. And as we have previously set forth, they establish various procedural and other requirements. In 2006, Congress enacted the particular statute before us. It differs from earlier statutes in that it focuses directly upon persons who, due to a mental illness, are sexually dangerous. Notably, many of these individuals were likely already subject to civil commitment under Section 4246, which, since 1949, has authorized the post-sentence detention of federal prisoners who suffer from a mental illness and who are thereby dangerous, whether sexually or otherwise. Aside from its specific focus on sexually dangerous persons, Section 4248 is similar to the provisions first enacted in 1949. In that respect, it is a modest addition to a long-standing federal statutory framework which has been in place since 1855. Third, Congress reasonably extended its long-standing civil commitment system to cover mentally ill and sexually dangerous persons who are already in federal custody even if doing so detains them beyond the termination of their criminal sentence. For one thing, the federal government is the custodian of its prisoners. As federal custodian, it has the constitutional power to act in order to protect nearby and other communities from the danger federal prisoners may pose. If a federal prisoner is infected with a communicable disease that threatens others, Surely it would be necessary and proper for the federal government to take action pursuant to its role as federal custodian to refuse, at least until the threat diminishes, to release that individual among the general public where he might infect others, even if not threatening an interstate epidemic. And if confinement of such an individual is a necessary and proper thing to do, then how could it not be similarly necessary and proper to confine an individual whose mental illness threatens others to the same degree? Moreover, it is reasonably adapted to Congress's power to act as a responsible federal custodian, a power that rests in turn upon federal criminal statutes that legitimately seek to implement constitutionally enumerated authority. Congress could have reasonably concluded that federal inmates who suffer from a mental illness that causes them to have serious difficulty in refraining from sexually violent conduct would pose an especially high danger to the public if released. And Congress could also have reasonably concluded, as detailed in the Judicial Conference's report, that a reasonable number of such individuals would likely not be detained by the states if released from federal custody, in part because the federal government itself severed their claim to legal residence in any state by incarcerating them in remote federal prisons. Here, Congress's desire to address the specific challenges identified in the report cited above, taken together with its responsibilities as a federal custodian, supports the conclusion that Section 4248 satisfies review for means and rationality, i.e. that it satisfies the Constitution's insistence that a federal statute represent a rational means for implementing a constitutional grant of legislative authority. Fourth, the statute properly accounts for state interests. 
Respondents and the dissent contend that Section 4248 violates the Tenth Amendment because it invades the province of state sovereignty in an area typically left to state control. But the Tenth Amendment's text is clear. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The powers delegated to the United States by the Constitution include those specifically enumerated powers listed in Article I, along with the implementation authority granted by the Necessary and Proper Clause. Virtually by definition, these powers are not powers that the Constitution reserved to the states. Nor does this statute invade state sovereignty or otherwise improperly limit the scope of powers that remain with the states. To the contrary, it requires accommodation of state interests. The Attorney General must inform the state in which the federal prisoner is domiciled or was tried that he is detaining someone with respect to whom those states may wish to assert their authority, and he must encourage those states to assume custody of the individual. He must also immediately release that person to the appropriate official of either state, if such state will assume such responsibility. And either state has the right at any time to assert its authority over the individual, which will prompt the individual's immediate transfer to state custody. Respondents contend that the states are nonetheless powerless to prevent the detention of their citizens under, even if detention is contrary to the state's policy choices. But that is not the most natural reading of the statute, and the Solicitor General acknowledges that the federal government would have no appropriate role with respect to an individual covered by the statute once the transfer to state responsibility and state control has occurred. In Greenwood, the court rejected a challenge to the current statute's predecessor. The petitioners in that case claimed, like the respondents here, that the statute improperly interfered with state sovereignty. But the court rejected that argument, and the version of that statute at issue in Greenwood was less protective of state interests than the current statute. That statute authorized federal custody so long as suitable arrangements were not otherwise available in a state or otherwise. Here, by contrast, as we have explained, Section 4248 requires the Attorney General to encourage the relevant states to take custody of the individual without inquiring into the suitability of their intended care or treatment and to relinquish federal authority whenever a state asserts its own. Thus, if the statute at issue in Greenwood did not invade state interests, then a fortiori neither does Section 4248. Fifth, the link between Section 4248 and an enumerated Article I power are not too attenuated. Neither is the statutory provision too sweeping in its scope. Invoking the cautionary instruction that we may not pile inference upon inference in order to sustain congressional action under Article I, respondents argue that, when legislating pursuant to the necessary and proper clause, Congress's authority can be no more than one step removed from a specifically enumerated power. But this argument is irreconcilable with our precedents. Again, take Greenwood as an example. In that case, we upheld the likely indefinite civil commitment of a mentally incompetent federal defendant who was accused of robbing a United States post office. The underlying enumerated Article I power was the power to establish post offices and post roads. But as Chief Justice Marshall recognized in McCulloch, the power to establish post offices and post roads is executed by the single act of making the establishment. From this has been inferred the power and duty of carrying the mail along the post road from one post office to another, and from this implied power has again been inferred the right to punish those who steal letters from the post office or rob the mail. And, as we have explained, from the implied power to punish, we have further inferred both the power to imprison and, in Greenwood, the federal civil commitment power.
Our necessary and proper jurisprudence contains multiple examples of similar reasoning. For example, in Sabri, we observe that Congress has authority under the spending clause to appropriate federal monies, and that it therefore has corresponding authority under the necessary and proper clause to see to it that taxpayer dollars are not siphoned off by corrupt public officers. We then further held that, in aid of that implied power to criminalize graft of taxpayer dollars, Congress has the additional prophylactic power to criminalize bribes or kickbacks, even when the stolen funds have not been traceably skimmed from specific federal payments. Indeed, even the dissent acknowledges that Congress has the implied power to criminalize any conduct that might interfere with the exercise of an enumerated power, and also the additional power to imprison people who violate those inferentially authorized laws, and the additional power to provide for the safe and reasonable management of those prisons, and the additional power to regulate the prisoner's behavior even after their release. Of course, each of those powers, like the powers addressed in Sabri, Hall, and McCulloch, is ultimately derived from an enumerated power. And as the dissent agrees, that enumerated power is the enumerated power that justifies the defendant's statute of conviction. Neither we nor the dissent can point to a single specific enumerated power that justifies a criminal defendant's arrest or conviction in all cases because Congress relies on different enumerated powers to enact its various federal criminal statutes. Every such statute must itself be legitimately predicated on an enumerated power, and the same enumerated power that justifies the creation of a federal criminal statute and that justifies the additional implied federal powers that the dissent considers legitimate, justifies civil commitment under Section 4248 as well. Thus, we must reject respondents' argument that the necessary and proper clause permits no more than a single step between an enumerated power and an act of Congress. Nor need we fear that our holding today confers on Congress a general police power, which the founders denied the national government and reposed in the states. As the Solicitor General repeatedly confirmed at oral argument, Section 4248 is narrow in scope. It has been applied to only a small fraction of federal prisoners. Indeed, the Solicitor General argues that the federal government would not have the power to commit a person who has been released from prison and whose period of supervised release is also completed. Thus, far from a general police power, Section 4248 is a reasonably adopted and narrowly tailored means of pursuing the government's legitimate interest as a federal custodian and the responsible administration of its prison system. To be sure, as we have previously acknowledged, the federal government undertakes activities today that would have been unimaginable to the framers in two senses. First, because the framers would not have conceived that any government would conduct such activities. And second, because the framers would not have believed that the federal government, rather than the states, would assume such responsibilities. Yet the powers conferred upon the federal government by the Constitution were phrased in language broad enough to allow for the expansion of the federal government role. The framers demonstrated considerable foresight in drafting a constitution capable of such resilience through time. As Chief Justice Marshall observed nearly 200 years ago, the necessary and proper clause is part of a constitution intended to endure for ages to come, and consequently to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. We take these five considerations together. They include... 1. The breadth of the Necessary and Proper Clause. 2. The long history of federal involvement in this arena. 3. The sound reasons for the statute's enactment in light of the government's custodial interest in safeguarding the public from dangers posed by those in federal custody. 4. The statute's accommodation of state interests. And 5. The statute's narrow scope. Taken together, these considerations lead us to conclude
that the statute is a necessary and proper means of exercising the federal authority that permits Congress to create federal criminal laws to punish their violation, to imprison violators, to provide appropriately for those imprisoned, and to maintain the security of those who are not imprisoned but who may be affected by the federal imprisonment of others. The Constitution consequently authorizes Congress to enact the statute. We do not reach or decide any claim that the statute or its application denies equal protection of the laws, procedural or substantive due process, or any other rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Respondents are free to pursue those claims on remand and any others they have preserved. The judgment of the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit with respect to Congress's power to enact the statute is reversed and the case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. It is so ordered. Justice Kennedy concurring in the judgment. The court is correct in my view to hold that the challenge portions of 18 USC section 4248 are necessary and proper exercises of congressional authority. Respondents argue that congressional authority under the necessary and proper clause can be no more than one step removed from an enumerated power. This is incorrect when the inquiry is whether a federal law has sufficient links to an enumerated power to be within the scope of federal authority. The analysis depends not on the number of links in the congressional power chain, but on the strength of the chain. Concluding that a relation can be put into a verbal formulation that fits somewhere along a causal chain of federal powers is merely the beginning, not the end of a constitutional inquiry. The inferences must be controlled by some limitations test, lest, as Thomas Jefferson warned, congressional powers become completely unbounded by linking one power to another ad infinitum in a veritable game of this is the house that Jack built. This separate writing serves two purposes. The first is to withhold assent from certain statements and propositions of the court's opinion. The second is to caution that the Constitution does require the invalidation of congressional attempts to extend federal powers in some instances. The court concludes that when determining whether Congress has the authority to enact a specific law under the Necessary and Proper Clause, we look to see whether the statute constitutes a means that is rationally related to the implementation of a constitutionally enumerated power. The terms rationally related and rational basis must be employed with care, particularly if either is to be used as a standalone test. The phrase rational basis most often is employed to describe the standard for determining whether legislation that does not prescribe fundamental liberties nonetheless violates the due process clause. Referring to this due process inquiry in, in what must be one of the most deferential formulations of the standard for reviewing legislation in all the court's precedents, the court has said, but the law need not be in every respect logically consistent with its aims to be constitutional. It is enough that there is an evil at hand for correction and that it might be thought that the particular legislative measure was a rational way to correct it. This formulation was in a case presenting a due process challenge and a challenge to a state's exercise of its own powers, powers not confined by the principles that control the limited nature of our national government. The phrase, then, should not be extended uncritically to the issue before us. The operative constitutional provision in this case is the necessary and proper clause. This court has not held that the Lee optical test asking if it might be thought that the particular legislative measure was a rational way to correct an evil is the proper test in this context. Rather, under the necessary and proper clause, application of a rational basis test should be at least as exacting as it has been in the Commerce Clause cases, if not more so, 
Indeed, the cases the court cites in the portion of its opinion referring to rational basis are predominantly Commerce Clause cases and none are due process cases. There is an important difference between the two questions, but the court does not make this distinction clear. Rake, Lopez, and Hodel were all Commerce Clause cases. Those precedents require a tangible link to commerce, not a mere conceivable rational relation as in the optical, simply because Congress may conclude that a particular activity substantially affects interstate commerce does not necessarily make it so. The rational basis referred to in the Commerce Clause context is a demonstrated link in fact based on empirical demonstration. While undoubtedly deferential, this may well be different from the rational basis test as Lee Optical described it. The court relies on Sabri for its conclusion that a means ends rationality is all that is required for a power to come within the necessary and proper clauses reach. It should be remembered, moreover, that the spending power is not designated as such in the Constitution, but rather is implied from the power to lay and collect taxes and other specified exactions in order, among other purposes, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. The limits upon the spending power have not been much discussed, but if the relevant standard is parallel to the Commerce Clause cases, then the limits and the analytic approach in those precedents should be respected. A separate concern stems from the court's explanation of the Tenth Amendment. I had thought it a basic principle that the powers reserved to the states consist of the whole undefined residuum of power remaining after taking account of powers granted to the national government. The Constitution delegates limited powers to the national government and then reserves the remainder for the states or the people, not the other way around, as the court's analysis suggests and the powers reserved to the states are so broad that they remain undefined. Residual power, sometimes referred to, perhaps imperfectly, as the police power, belongs to the states and to the states alone. It is correct in one sense to say that if the national government has the power to act under the necessary and proper clause, then that power is not one reserved to the states. But the precepts of federalism embodied in the Constitution inform which powers are properly exercised by the national government in the first place. It is of fundamental importance to consider whether essential attributes of state sovereignty are compromised by the assertion of federal power under the necessary and proper clause. If so, that is a factor suggesting that the power is not one properly within the reach of federal power. The opinion of the court should not be interpreted to hold that the only or even the principal constraints on the exercise of congressional power are the Constitution's express prohibitions. The court's discussion of the Tenth Amendment invites the inference that restrictions flowing from the federal system are of no import when defining the limits of the national government's power, as it proceeds by first asking whether the power is within the national government's reach, and if so, it discards federalism concerns entirely. These remarks explain why the court ignores important limitations stemming from federalism principles. Those principles are essential to an understanding of the function and province of the states in our constitutional structure. As stated at the outset, in this case, Congress has acted within its powers to ensure that an abrupt end to the federal detention of prisoners does not endanger third parties. Federal prisoners often lack a single home state to take charge of them due to their lengthy prison stays, so it is incumbent on the national government to act. This obligation, parallel in some respects, to duties defined in tort law is not to put in motion a particular force, here an unstable and dangerous person that endangers others. Having acted within its constitutional authority to detain a person, the national government can acknowledge a duty to ensure that an abrupt end to the detention does not prejudice the states and their citizens. 
I would note, as the court's opinion does, that Section 44A does not supersede the right and responsibility of the states to identify persons who ought to be subject to civil confinement. The federal program in question applies only to those in federal custody and thus involves little intrusion upon the ordinary processes and powers of the state. This is not a case in which the national government demands that a state use its own governmental system to implement federal commands. It is not a case in which the national government relieves the states of their own primary responsibility to enact laws and policies for the safety and well-being of their citizens. Nor is it a case in which the exercise of national power intrudes upon functions and duties traditionally committed to the state. Rather, this is a discreet and narrow exercise of authority over a small class of persons already subject to the federal power. Importantly, Section 4248D requires the Attorney General to release any civil detainee to the appropriate official of the state in which the person is domiciled or was tried if such state will assume responsibility for his custody, care, and treatment, providing a strong assurance that the proffered reason for the legislation's necessity is not a mere artifice. With these observations, I concur in the judgment of the court. Justice Alito, concurring in the judgment. I am concerned about the breadth of the court's language and the ambiguity of the standards the court applies, but I am persuaded on narrow grounds that it was necessary and proper for Congress to enact the statute at issue in this case in order to carry into execution powers specifically conferred on Congress by the Constitution. Section 4248 was enacted to protect the public from federal prisoners who suffer from a severe mental illness, abnormality, or disorder, and who, if released, would have serious difficulty in refraining from sexually violent conduct or child molestation. Under this law, if neither the state of a prisoner's domicile nor the state in which the prisoner was tried will assume the responsibility for the prisoner's custody, care, and treatment, the federal government is authorized to undertake that responsibility. The statute recognizes that in many cases, no state will assume the heavy financial burden of civilly committing a dangerous federal prisoner who, as a result of lengthy federal incarceration, no longer has any substantial ties to any state. I entirely agree with the dissent that the necessary and proper clause empowers Congress to enact only those laws that carry into execution one or more of the federal powers enumerated in the Constitution. But Section 4248 satisfies that requirement because it is a necessary and proper means of carrying into execution the powers that support the federal criminal statutes under which the affected prisoners were convicted. The necessary and proper clause provides the constitutional authority for most federal criminal statutes. In other words, most federal criminal statutes rest upon a congressional judgment that, in order to execute one or more of the powers conferred on Congress, it is necessary and proper to criminalize certain conduct, and in order to do that, it is obviously necessary and proper to provide for the operation of a federal criminal justice system and a federal prison system. All of this has been recognized since the beginning of our country. The first Congress enacted federal criminal laws, created federal law enforcement and prosecutorial positions, established a federal court system, provided for the imprisonment of persons convicted of federal crimes, and gave United States Marshals the responsibility of securing federal prisoners. The only additional question presented here is whether, in order to carry into execution the enumerated powers on which the federal criminal laws rest, it is also necessary and proper for Congress to protect the public from dangers created by the federal criminal justice and prison systems. In my view, the answer to that question is yes just as it is necessary and proper for Congress to provide for the apprehension of escaped federal prisoners, it is necessary and proper for Congress to provide for the civil commitment of dangerous federal prisoners who would otherwise escape civil commitment as a result of federal imprisonment. Some years ago, 
A distinguished study group created by the Judicial Conference of the United States found that, in a disturbing number of cases, no state was willing to assume the financial burden of providing for the civil commitment of federal prisoners who, if left at large after the completion of their sentences, would present a danger to any communities in which they chose to live or visit. These federal prisoners, having been held for years in a federal prison, often have few ties to any state. It was a matter of speculation where they would choose to go upon release. And accordingly, no state was enthusiastic about volunteering to shoulder the burden of civil commitment. The necessary and proper clause did not give car Congress carte blanche. Although the term necessary does not mean absolutely necessary or indispensable, the term requires an appropriate link between a power conferred by the Constitution and the law enacted by Congress, and it's an obligation of this court to enforce compliance with that limitation. The law in question here satisfies that requirement. This is not a case in which it's merely possible for a court to think of a rational basis on which Congress might have perceived an attenuated link between the powers underlying the federal criminal statutes and the challenged civil commitment provision. Here, there is a substantial link to Congress's constitutional powers. For this reason, I concur in the judgment that Congress had the constitutional authority to act 18 U.S.C. section 4248. Justice Thomas, with whom Justice Scalia joins in all but Part 3A1B, dissenting. The court holds today that Congress has power under the necessary and proper clause to enact a law authorizing the federal government to civilly commit sexually dangerous persons beyond the date it lawfully could hold them on a charge or conviction for a federal crime. I disagree. The necessary and proper clause empowers Congress to enact only those laws that carry into execution one or more of the federal powers enumerated in the Constitution. Because Section 4248 executes no enumerated power, I must respectfully dissent. As every school child learns, our Constitution establishes a system of dual sovereignty between the states and the federal government, in our system, the federal government's powers are enumerated and hence limited. Thus, Congress has no power to act unless the Constitution authorizes it to do so. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. This constitutional structure establishes different default rules for Congress and the states. Congress's powers are few and defined, while those that belong to the states remain numerous and indefinite. The Constitution plainly sets forth the few and defined powers that Congress may exercise. Article 1 vests in Congress all legislative powers herein granted, and carefully enumerates those powers in Section 8. The final clause of Section 8, the Necessary and Proper Clause, authorizes Congress to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the Government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. As the clause's placement at the end of Section 8 indicates, the foregoing powers are those granted to Congress in the preceding clauses of that section. The other powers to which the clause refers are those vested in Congress and the other branches by other specific provisions of the Constitution. Chief Justice Marshall famously summarized Congress's authority under the Necessary and Proper Clause in McCulloch, which has stood for nearly 200 years as this court's definitive interpretation of that text. Let the end be legitimate. Let it be within the scope of the Constitution, and all means which are appropriate, which are plainly adapted to that end, which are not prohibited, but consist with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, are constitutional. McCulloch's summation is descriptive of the clause itself, providing that federal legislation is a valid exercise of Congress's authority under the clause,
if the sun espies a two-part test. First, the law must be directed toward a legitimate end, which McCulloch defines as one within the scope of the Constitution. That is, the powers expressly delegated to the federal government by some provision in the Constitution. Second, there must be a necessary and proper fit between the means, the federal law, and the end, the enumerated power or powers, if it is designed to serve. McCulloch accords Congress a certain amount of discretion in assessing means and fit under this second inquiry. The means Congress selects will be deemed necessary if they are appropriate and plainly adapted to the exercise of an enumerated power and proper if they are not otherwise prohibited by the Constitution and not inconsistent with its letter and spirit. Critically, however, McCulloch underscores the linear relationship the clause establishes between the two inquiries. Unless the end itself is legitimate, the fit between means and end is irrelevant. In other words, no matter how necessary or proper an act of Congress may be to its objective, Congress lacks authority to legislate if the objective is anything other than carrying into execution one or more of the federal government's enumerated powers. This limitation was of utmost importance to the framers. During the state ratification debates, anti-federalists expressed concern that the necessary and proper clause would give Congress virtually unlimited power. Federalist supporters of the Constitution swiftly refuted that charge, explaining that the clause did not grant Congress any freestanding authority, but instead made explicit what was already implicit in the grant of each enumerated power. Referring to the powers declared in the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton noted that it is expressly to these powers that the sweeping clause authorizes the national legislature to pass all necessary and proper laws. James Madison echoed his view, stating that the sweeping clause only extends to the enumerated powers. Statements by delegates to the state ratification conventions indicate that this understanding was widely held by the founding generation. Roughly 30 years after the Constitution's ratification, McCulloch firmly established this understanding in our constitutional jurisprudence. Since then, our precedents uniformly have maintained that the necessary and proper clause is not an independent fount of congressional authority, but rather a caveat that Congress possesses all the means necessary to carry out the specifically granted foregoing powers of Section E and all other powers vested by this Constitution. Section 4248 establishes a federal civil commitment regime for certain persons in the custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. If the Attorney General demonstrates to a federal court by clear and convincing evidence that a person subject to the statute is sexually dangerous, a court may order the person committed until he is no longer a risk to others, even if that does not occur until after his federal criminal sentence has expired or the statute of limitations on the federal charge against him has run. No enumerated power in Article 1, Section 8 expressly delegates to Congress the power to enact a civil commitment regime for sexually dangerous persons nor does any other provision in the Constitution vest Congress or the other branches of the federal government with such a power. Accordingly, Section 4248 can be a valid exercise of congressional authority only if it is necessary and proper for carrying into execution one or more of those federal powers actually enumerated in the Constitution. Section 4248 does not fall within any of those powers. The government identifies no specific enumerated power or powers as a constitutional predicate for Section 4248, and none are readily discernible. Indeed, not even the Commerce Clause, the enumerated power this Court has interpreted most expansively, can justify federal civil detention of sex offenders. Under the Court's precedence, Congress may not regulate non-economic activity, such as sexual violence, based solely on the effect such activity may have 
in individual cases or in the aggregate on interstate commerce. That limitation forecloses any claim that Section 424A carries into execution Congress's Commerce Clause power, and the government has never argued otherwise. This court, moreover, consistently has recognized that the power to care for the mentally ill and, where necessary, the power to protect the community from the dangerous tendencies of some mentally ill persons are among the numerous powers that remain with the states. As a consequence, we have held that states may take measures to restrict the freedom of the dangerously mentally ill, including those who are sexually dangerous, provided that such commitments satisfy due process and other constitutional requirements. Section 4248 closely resembles the involuntary civil commitment laws that states have enacted under their parents' patriae and general police powers. Indeed, it is clear on the face of the act and in the government's arguments urging its constitutionality that Section 4248 is aimed at protecting society from acts of sexual violence, not toward carrying into execution any enumerated power or powers of the federal government. To be sure, protecting society from violent sexual offenders is certainly an important end. Sexual abuse is a despicable act with untold consequences for the victim personally and society generally, but the Constitution does not vest in Congress the authority to protect society from every bad act that might befall it. In my view, this should decide the question. Section 4248 runs afoul of our settled understanding of Congress's power under the Necessary and Proper Clause. Congress may act under that clause only when its legislation carries into execution one of the federal government's enumerated powers, Section 4248 does not execute any enumerated power. Section 4248 is therefore unconstitutional. The court perfunctorily genuflects to McCulloch's framework for assessing Congress's necessary and proper clause authority and to the principle of dual sovereignty it helps to maintain, then promptly abandons both in favor of a novel five-factor test supporting its conclusion that Section 4248 is a necessary and proper adjunct to a jumble of unenumerated authorities. The court's newly minted test cannot be reconciled with the clause's plain text or with two centuries of our precedents interpreting it. It also raises more questions than it answers. Must each of the five considerations exist before the court sustains future federal legislation as proper exercises of Congress's necessary and proper clause authority? What if the facts of the given case support a finding of only four considerations or three? And if three or four will suffice, which three or four are imperative? At a minimum, this shift from the two-step McCulloch framework to this five-consideration approach warrants an explanation as to why McCulloch is no longer good enough and which of the five considerations will bear the most weight in future cases, assuming some number less than five suffices, or if not, why all five are required. The court provides no answers to these questions. I begin with the first and last considerations in the court's inquiry. The court concludes that Section 4248 is a valid exercise of Congress's necessary and proper clause authority because that authority is broad and because the links between Section 4248 and an enumerated Article I power are not too attenuated. In so doing, the court first inverts, then misapplies McCulloch's straightforward two-part test. A. First, the court describes Congress's lawmaking power under the Necessary and Proper Clause as broad, relying on precedents that have upheld federal laws under the clause after finding a rational fit between the law and an enumerated power. It is true that this court's precedents allow Congress a certain degree of latitude in selecting the means for carrying into execution an end that is legitimate, but in citing these cases, the court puts the cart before the horse. The fit between means and ends matters only if the end is in fact legitimate, i.e. 
only if it is one of the federal government's enumerated powers. By starting its inquiry with the degree of deference owed to Congress in selecting means to further a legitimate end, the court bypasses McCulloch's first step and fails carefully to examine whether the end served by Section 4248 is actually one of those powers. Second, instead of asking the simple question of what enumerated power Section 4248 carries into execution at McCulloch's first step, the court surveys other laws Congress has enacted and concludes that because Section 4248 is related to those laws, the links between Section 4248 and an enumerated power are not too attenuated. Hence, Section 4248 is a valid exercise of Congress's necessary and proper clause authority. This unnecessarily confuses the analysis and, if followed to its logical extreme, would result in an unwarranted expansion of federal power. The court observes that Congress has the undisputed authority to criminalize conduct that interferes with enumerated powers, to imprison individuals who engage in that conduct, to enact laws governing those prisons, and to serve as a custodian of its prisoners. From this, the court assumes that Section 4248 must also be a valid exercise of congressional power because it is reasonably adapted to those exercises of Congress's incidental and thus unenumerated authorities. But that is not the question. The Necessary and Proper Clause does not provide Congress with authority to enact any law simply because it furthers other laws Congress has enacted in the exercise of its incidental authority. The clause plainly requires a showing that every federal statute carries into execution one or more of the federal government's enumerated powers. Federal laws that criminalize conduct that interferes with enumerated powers establish prisons for those who engage in that conduct and set rules for the care and treatment of prisoners awaiting trial or serving a criminal sentence satisfy this test because each helps to carry into execution the enumerated powers that justify a criminal defendant's arrest or conviction. For example, Congress's enumerated power to establish post offices and post roads would lack force or practical effect if Congress lacked the authority to enact criminal laws to punish those who steal letters from the post office or rob the mail. Similarly, that enumerated power would be compromised if there were no prisons to hold persons who violate those laws, or if those prisons were so poorly managed that prisoners could escape or demand their release on the grounds that the conditions of their confinement violate their constitutional rights, at least as we have defined them. Civil detention under Section 4248, on the other hand, lacks any such connection to an enumerated power. 2. After focusing on the relationship between Section 4248 and several of Congress's implied powers, the court finally concludes that the civil detention of a sexually dangerous person under Section 4248 carries into execution the enumerated power that justified that person's arrest or conviction in the first place. In other words, the court analogizes Section 4248 to federal laws that authorize prison officials to care for federal inmates while they serve sentences or await trial. But while those laws help to carry into execution the enumerated power that justifies the imposition of criminal sanctions on the inmate, Section 4248 does not bear that essential characteristic for three reasons. First, the statute's definition of a sexually dangerous person contains no element relating to the subject's crime. It thus does not require a federal court to find any connection between the reason supporting civil commitment and the enumerated power with which that person's criminal conduct interfered. As a result, Section 4248 allows a court to civilly commit an individual without finding that he was ever charged with or convicted of a federal crime involving sexual violence. That possibility is not merely hypothetical. The government concedes that nearly 20% of individuals against whom Section 4248 proceedings have been brought fits this description. Second, Section 4248 permits the term 
a federal civil commitment to continue beyond the date on which a convicted prisoner sentence expires or the date on which the statute of limitations on an untried defendant's crime has run. The statute, therefore, authorizes federal custody over a person at a time when the government would lack jurisdiction to detain him for violating a criminal law that executes an enumerated power. The statute this court upheld in Greenwood v. United States provides a useful contrast. That statute authorized the federal government to exercise civil custody over a federal defendant declared mentally unfit to stand trial only until the accused shall be mentally competent to stand trial or until the pending charges against him are disposed of according to law. Thus, that statute's end, reasonably, could be interpreted as a preserving the government's power to enforce a criminal law against the accused. Section 4248, however, authorizes federal detention of a person even after the government loses the authority to prosecute him for a federal crime. Third, the definition of a sexually dangerous person relevant to Section 4248 does not require the court to find that the person is likely to violate a law executing an enumerated power in the future. Although the federal government has no express power to regulate sexual violence generally, Congress has passed a number of laws prescribing such conduct in special circumstances. All of these statutes contain jurisdictional elements that require a connection to one of Congress's enumerated powers, such as interstate commerce, or that limit the statute's coverage to jurisdictions in which Congress has plenary authority. By contrast, authorizes civil commitment upon a showing that the person is sexually dangerous and presents a risk to others. It requires no evidence that this sexually dangerous condition will manifest itself in a way that interferes with a federal law that executes an enumerated power or in a geographic location over which Congress has plenary authority. In sum, the enumerated powers that justify a criminal defendant's arrest or conviction cannot justify his subsequent civil detention under Section 4248b. The remaining considerations in the Court's five-part inquiry do not alter this conclusion. First, in a final attempt to analogize Section 4248 to laws that authorize the federal government to provide care and treatment to prisoners, while they await trial or serve a criminal sentence, the court cites the second restatement of torts for the proposition that the federal government has a custodial interest in its prisoners, and thus a broad constitutional power to act in order to protect nearby and other communities from the dangers they may pose. That citation is puzzling because federal authority derives from the Constitution, not the common law. In any event, nothing in the restatement suggests that a common law custodian has the powers that Congress seeks here. While the restatement provides that a custodian has a duty to take reasonable steps to ensure that a person in his care does not cause bodily harm to others, that duty terminates once the legal basis for custody expires. There is no duty so to control the conduct of a third person as to prevent him from causing physical harm to another unless a a special relation exists between the actor and the third person which imposes a duty upon the actor to control the third person's conduct, or b. A special relation exists between the actor and the other which gives to the other a right to protection. Once the federal government's criminal jurisdiction over a prisoner ends, so does any special relationship between the government and the former prisoner. For this reason, I cannot agree with Justice Alito that Section 4248 is a necessary and proper incident of Congress's power to protect the public from dangers created by the federal criminal justice and prison systems. A federal criminal defendant's sexually dangerous propensities are not created by the fact of his incarceration or his relationship with the federal prison system. The fact that the federal government has the authority to imprison a person for the purpose of punishing him for a federal crime, sex-related or otherwise, does not provide the government with the additional power to exercise indefinite civil control over that person. Second, the court describes Section 4248 as a modest expansion on a statutory framework with a long historical pedigree. 
Yet, even if the antiquity of a practice could serve as a substitute for its constitutionality, and the court admits that it cannot, the court overstates the relevant history. Congress's first foray into this general area occurred in 1855, when it established St. Elizabeth's Hospital to provide treatment to insane persons in the military and the District of Columbia. But Congress was acting pursuant to enumerated powers when it took this step. This enactment therefore provides no support for Congress's claim power to detain sexually dangerous persons without an otherwise valid basis for jurisdiction. Later, Congress provided for the federal civil commitment of insane persons charged with or convicted of a federal crime. As the court explains, however, these statutes did not authorize federal custody beyond the completion of the term of federal imprisonment and thus shed no light on the question presented here. In 1949, Congress enacted a more comprehensive regime authorizing the civil commitment of mentally ill persons in BOP custody. This court addressed that regime in Greenwood, but never endorsed the proposition that the federal government could rely on that statute to detain a person in the absence of a pending criminal charge or ongoing criminal sentence. As already noted, Greenwood upheld the commitment of a federal defendant declared unfit to stand trial on the narrow ground that the government's criminal jurisdiction over the defendant its power to prosecute for federal offenses was not exhausted, but rather persisted in the form of a pending indictment. The court was careful to state that this commitment, and therefore the legislation authorizing commitment in the context of this case, involved an assertion of authority within congressional power under the necessary and proper clause. But it painstakingly limited its holding to the narrow constitutional issue raised by that order of commitment. The historical record thus supports the federal government's authority to detain a mentally ill person against whom it has the authority to enforce a criminal law, but it provides no justification whatsoever for reading the necessary and proper clause to grant Congress the power to authorize the detention of persons without a basis for federal criminal jurisdiction. Finally, the court offers two arguments regarding Section 4248's impact on the relationship between the federal government and the states. First, the court in both concurrences suggests that Congress must have had the power to enact Section 4248 because a long period of federal incarceration might sever a sexually dangerous prisoner's claim to legal residence in any particular state. I disagree with the premise of that argument. As an initial matter, States plainly have the constitutional authority to take charge of a federal prisoner released within their jurisdiction. In addition, the assumption that a state knowingly would fail to exercise that authority is, in my view, impossible. The government stated on oral, oral argument that its default position is to release a federal prisoner to the state in which he was convicted, and neither the court nor the concurrences argue that a state has the power to review such a person domicile within its borders. Thus, they appear to assume that in the absence of 18 U.S.C. Section 4248, a state would take no action when informed by the BOP that a sexually dangerous federal prisoner was about to be released within its jurisdiction. In light of the plethora of state laws enacted in recent decades to protect communities from sex offenders, the likelihood of such an occurrence seems quite remote, but even in the event a state made such a decision, the Constitution assigns a responsibility for that decision and its consequences to the state government alone. Next, the court submits that Section 4248 does not upset the balance of federalism or invade the state's reserved powers because it requires accommodation of state interests by instructing the Attorney General to release a committed person to the state in which he was domiciled or tried, if that state, should, state wishes to assume responsibility for him. More importantly, it is an altogether hollow assurance that Section 4248 preserves the principle of dual sovereignty, the letter and spirit of the Constitution, as the necessary and proper clause requires. For once it is determined that the Congress has the authority to provide for the civil detention of sexually dangerous persons, Congress is acting within the powers granted it under the Constitution and may impose its will on the state. 
Section 4248's so right of first refusal is thus not a matter of constitutional necessity, but an act of legislative grace. Nevertheless, 29 states appear as amici and argue that Section 4248 is constitutional. They tell us that they do not object to Congress retaining custody of sexually dangerous persons after their criminal sentences expire, because the cost of detaining such persons is expensive, approximately $64,000 per year, and these states would rather the federal government bear this expense. Congress's power, however, is fixed by the Constitution. It does not expand merely to suit the state's policy preferences or to allow state officials to avoid difficult choices regarding the allocation of state funds. By assigning the federal government power over certain enumerated objects only, the Constitution leaves to the several states a residuary and inviolable sovereignty over all other objects. The purpose of this design is to preserve the balance of power between the states and the federal government that protects our fundamental liberties. It is the state's duty to act as the immediate and visible guardian of those liberties because federal powers extend no further than those enumerated in the Constitution. The Constitution gives states no more power to decline this responsibility than it gives them to infringe upon those liberties in the first instance. Absent congressional action that is in accordance with or necessary and proper to an enumerated power, the duty to protect citizens from violent crime, including acts of sexual violence, belongs solely to the states. The founders denied the national government and reposed in the states, then the suppression of violent crime. Not long ago, this court described the necessary and proper clause as the last best hope of those who defend ultra vires congressional action. Regrettably, today's opinion breathes new life into that clause, and the court's protestations, to the contrary notwithstanding, comes perilously close to transforming the necessary and proper clause into a basis for the federal police power that we always have rejected. In so doing, the court endorses the precise abuse of power Article 1 is designed to prevent, the use of a limited grant of authority as a pretext for the accomplishment of objects not entrusted to the government. I respectfully dissent. This audio file was brought to you by Laudio. For more audio files, visit us at laudioforlisteners.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and check out our YouTube.